for it's a real honor and a pleasure to be speaking to such a committed group of people. Uh, so we've heard uh, a lot of you know great stories today about big data uh, and the way big data is really changing the world we live in, uh, and just been fantastic. Uh, I've had a great time. Uh, I'm here to tell a story about small data and how to make a commitment to data at the early stage uh, of an operation uh, solve big problems. Uh, so just a little bit of background on SeatGeek. Uh, it is the world's largest event ticket search engine. We search 400 primary and secondary markets. Uh, on any given day, we're ready to serve about 4.5 million ticket listings to uh, tens of thousands of concerts, sports, theater events uh, at thousands of venues uh, across the country and a few in Europe. Uh, ticket search is generally a main like consumer pain point. It's not an easy process. Uh, each user generally looking for one needle in that giant haystack and there's very little out there that really helps you find exactly what you're looking for. Uh, to navigate these waters and provide a best-in-class experience, we have made a fanatical focus on the end consumer experience, the fan, uh, and we've made a firm commitment to uh, using data in everything we do. Uh, so first up, focus on the consumer. Uh, seems obvious, it's not. Uh, if you've ever tried to buy tickets uh, to sports or music, you might have been wondering, like, who designed these systems and do they actually want me to go to this event? Uh, and that's because there's a wide array of incentive structures across various players in the system, and very few of them favor an excellent experience for the end consumer. Uh, so let's take a quick look at this ecosystem and see where SeatGeek fits in. At the top left of this chain, you have ticket promoters, or sorry, sports teams, venues, promoters, the producers of tickets uh, who buy ticketing services from a primary ticket seller, such as Ticketmaster, Ticketfly, uh, et cetera. And their job, as I think we saw the NFL uh, presentation earlier, is to sell the venue out. Uh, they sell it in sort of an IPO, initial public offering, at certain prices with the motivation of raising as much money in the primary market as they can. Uh, if the tickets are overpriced, nobody buys them, somebody gets fired. Uh, if they're underpriced, brokers buy them, they end up on the secondary market. Uh, if they're appropriately priced, everybody who has a ticket uh, gets the game, that never happens. Uh, so the secondary market has to exist. Uh, we have all these brokers over here, or resellers, uh, that focus primarily, or these, sorry, these, we have these secondary markets who focus primarily on the needs of resellers because their value proposition is from the network effect of having the most tickets available as possible. That's how they get the user eyeballs, and that's why brokers will pay 15, 25% fees in order to list their tickets on StubHub, uh, Tickets Now, Ticket Network, et cetera, and just reach that wide audience of end consumers. What we do is we search all of these secondary sellers for their inventory, and we're freed uh, from the needs of the sellers because we're agnostic about where the tickets come from, and we're just trying to help the consumer find out what they want out of everything that's there. So this freedom allows us to make normative judgments about the value of the products listed on our website and allows us to distinguish between what is actually a good deal and what is not. So how do we do this? Commitment to data. Uh, whatever the situation is, we think data first. Uh, three years ago on this very day, September 14, 2009, SeatGeek launched as a ticket price forecasting service. It was fair cast for tickets. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, as a monetization technique, the founders added ticket listings to the website and quickly found that what people really liked was a holistic view of the current state of the market. And then they set out to use data to make that experience as painless as possible, the experience of buying tickets when you already know you want them. Know your limits. Uh, ticket market after the IPO is absolutely nothing like the modern stock market. It's a one-sided offer matching marketplace wherein sellers set their prices and buyers lift them. There's very little liquidity once you've bought a ticket. You have to pay another 25% fee in order to sell it. Uh, there's long transaction times. It's, it's a mess. Uh, and 
we're trying to provide a comprehensive view into this market with very little data. And we, wanted, we set out to find out what each of these 4 million tickets is actually worth and how much people should be paying for them. So we decided let's price millions of tickets every day on page load, tell everybody what they're worth. To do that using the methods that I used to use on Wall Street is impossible. Uh, it just cannot be done with the amount of data that we have as a startup. because We don't have a lot of it. This is the market for the 300 remaining NFL games of this year. As you can see, there are about a million and a half listings representing over 5 million tickets. Uh, and about the average game has somewhere in the uh, 10 to 15,000 uh, tickets, seats available right now for the rest of the season on the secondary market. Uh, that's on the right. On the left, you have the 45,000 times that someone has clicked buy on our website for a 2012 NFL game. Uh, as you can see, the input is far dwarfed by what we need to do. <laughs> we need to be able to use those 45,000 signals as well as anything else we can get our hands on to predict the price that each of those listings will sell for in the end and the probability that they're going to be worth it if we want to maximize our own needs, which is making money as a company. So that's, that's, that's part of the problem. What's even more of a problem is that the market is ridiculously inefficient. Uh, there's no insight into it from the consumer side, so consumers are making uninformed decisions, so every signal that we do get is from somebody who has no idea what the market is actually like, which creates huge problems. This is uh, one row in one section uh, for a Justin Bieber concert uh, at the Barclays Center. I think it's in November. Uh, thinking about going. Uh, <laughs> so I've been looking, looking at tickets for it. Uh, and this, these, are, these are great seats right here, but as you can see, we've, got, we've had 18 different uh, listings that have been clicked by on in the past three months. And they range in price. There's a $75 range from the minimum to the maximum for, the, for pretty much, as far as we can tell, the exact same product. Uh, and as you can see, there's absolutely no trend. So we can't just you know, go lowest on it and say, all right, this is where it is now. Uh, the data is incredibly noisy. And so all we know right now is that yeah, people are probably willing to pay somewhere between $250 and $325 for this ticket, uh, which is you know, not good enough. <laughs> um, so summarize, uh, we have available input is sparse and of middling quality. And middling quality is probably an overstatement. Uh, and our acquired output is massive. We have to predict millions of tickets every single day. And it needs to be very accurate. Because if we say something is a bad deal and it's actually a good deal, then we provide no value to the consumer we've eliminated our value proposition. If we say something is a good deal and it's a bad deal, that's even worse. That hurts the consumer because they overpay for something or you know, if there's some sort of error, they might have, like, we might have missed what the ticket was or you know, said it was a great deal because we thought it was in a different place in the stadium. It's horrible, it embarrasses us, hurts the consumer, not a good thing. So how is this solved? Leverage everything. Uh, core to everything we do as SeatGeek in trying to figure out how to provide the best user experience is to use every piece of data we have across any different uh, response variable that we're trying to predict. Uh, so given the small signal volume uh, treated with this healthy skepticism that we need, what we need are models that we can trust more than our data. So what do we know about a listing? All we know about a listing is its price, we know where it is in the venue, where the seat is, and we know that the price is not so good that somebody has bought it already. So it's still there. Most ticketing applications stop there. It's standard, it's simple, it's easy, it's safe, you sort by price, it's also completely useless. Uh, the price of a ticket has no context surrounding it, and I always like to make the comparison that it's like going to Yahoo in 1997, you click through to the directory you're looking for, and you have links sorted alphabetically. Uh, doesn't help you. 
Uh, so before my time, the first sorting algorithm uh, that was used was took the face value of the ticket and tried to compute the reseller's markup. Va vast improvement over the state of the market at the time, yes. But it's objective, it appeals to a higher authority, it generally avoids obvious mistakes, still useless. Face values are in discrete tiers. So you have maybe 10 different levels at each different event, and they are also in the past. The market changes continuously, and you need to know what the value of the seat is now. We do like the markup idea, though, so let's stick with that. Uh, it's largely irrelevant how much a consumer could have paid for the ticket in the past. Uh, it is worthwhile to know what they should have paid if they were going to buy it today. So let's see what data we have. Uh, in e-commerce business, such as ours, the best signals that we're going to get are sales. Uh, so at the seat level, we have a bunch of sales. We know where the seat is. We know what's been clicked on, et cetera. The events, we still have you know, sales clicks. We know the performer. We have some measure of you know, the demand that people have to see Justin Bieber. Uh, it's very high. Uh, <laughs> people love that guy. Uh, so we treat sales by, as by far the most important input variable. They're also what we have the least of. Uh, but it's important for reasons that become apparent, so keep sales in mind. Uh, with all this data, we've got to do three things with our model. Uh, one, we need a model that can deal with very small input relative to the required output. Uh, number two, it needs to be able to predict thousands of ticket prices upon a page load, so it needs to be very fast. And number three, is that it needs to be able to learn from its mistakes. And it needs to be able to know what happens when a new ticket is sold and what it says about how well we predicted its price. More important than our commitment to data, this requires a commitment to data science. As I said earlier, we need to trust our model because the data will lie and does all the time. So we set out to isolate two elements of the system that are relatively constant. Uh, First, the quality of the seats uh, varies greatly within a venue. Uh, your courtside seats at the Knicks game are always going to be better and higher priced than your nosebleeds. Uh, but the quality of a given seat doesn't vary a whole lot from one Knicks game to the other. As I said, courtside, way better than nosebleed, but it's always way better. So we can make a huge simplifying assumption by applying one uh, number to the quality of a seat using a healthy amount of uh, bootstrapping and gradient descent, we have gotten ourselves to the point where, as of a year ago, we had about, I think, 15 discrete seat values for the 30 NFL venues. We currently have 500,000 distinct seat scores for 1,000 venues across the country uh, that, have been predicting, uh, that have been predicting very reliable outputs for the last six months or so. Uh, Next, demand for tickets is very event specific, uh, but it isn't going to change from page load to page load. It changes slower than that. So what we do is we batch process the signals whenever we've got enough of them that we think it might change our understanding of the state of the system and pass them through about 5,000 Bayesian filters, which each hold our estimate of the demand curve for a single event. Uh, we combine those two values into what we think is the buy side fair value, what a buyer would pay if someone has just said, all right, well, uh, here's the ticket, make us an offer. That's generally how we think of our fair value as looking into the buy side the way we can't because we do not have an open call two-sided market that we can just you know, pull down a live market data feed from, although that would be wonderful. Uh, so, and I'm not going to go too deep into the math here, but if you do want to read uh, about it, it is on our blog, which I suppose you could Google, because um, I don't have the URL up here, uh, and there's a lot of words in it. Uh, the uh, second part of it is that in real time, after we have our view of the buy side of the market, the demand side, we then uh, search uh, these ticket sellers and get a state of the supply side of the market and try to figure out, all right, what are the sellers telling us about what they're willing to sell something for? And by combining the buy side and the supply side, 
we can make some implicit assumptions about the final distribution of all tickets that are gonna be sold to an event. It's relatively consistent how far above what we think the expected value should be that you know, the X percentile is about in the same place for most different events. Make that simplifying assumption and we end up with deal score, uh, which is by far the best in class way, uh, if I do say so myself, uh, of searching for event tickets and making sure that you get the best deal. Uh, if you see a 95 deal score on SeatGeek, then you know that that is in the 95th percentile of eventual ticket sales, you're gonna have gotten a better deal than 95% of the people that you're sitting with. Uh, we've, we've gotten luxury boxes at concerts for 65 bucks a piece, we found uh, box seats at Fenway for 50 bucks a piece back when the Red Sox were good. Uh, we find uh, plenty, we find tons of amazing deals on here all the time, uh, and it's it got it, I mean it ended up resulting in the fact that I now I go to like three or four concerts a week, um, which is a problem because I still end up spending way more money than I would have otherwise. Um, so it's not wallet score. <laughs> Uh, in any case, uh, we could stop there, but that's not really any fun. So what works with small data uh, works better with bigger data uh, because the more informed the consumers are, uh, the better the signals that they are sending back into the model, uh, which allows us to create this virtual cycle where the outputs become the new inputs and everybody who shops for tickets on the internet tells us how we are doing. Uh, and Ticket purchases feed everything we do. This, of course, brings us back to the critical point of small data, leverage everything, and fast. Every single ticket purchase that we know about is fed right back into deal score within 24 hours at like, the very maximum. Sometimes uh, it, becomes way fa it comes in way faster than that, and the you know, supply state of the market is taken every single time we hit uh, an event page. Uh, and then cached for the next visitor, uh, which creates a help me, help you cycle uh, between SeatGeeks and users. I uh, respond by providing us more and more data every month. Uh, I've been evangelizing small data for about a year now. Uh, ever since I started working here, I've been talking about small data and how it's still useful, uh, but I might need a new shtick uh, for chapter two. <laughs> Uh, small goes big because we are rapidly accumulating uh, more and more data as we uh, grow. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, if I can leave you with the best thing that I've learned, it is this. Uh, creating a symbiotic relationship and a virtuous cycle with your users and leveraging their results uh, makes small data stand tall, but it is completely useless without a firm commitment to data science, laser sharp focus on the consumer, thank you. <laughs>